an object as big as like my thumb would take 13 or 14 hours no, no, and no, I would no. literally sit there and just watch it and watch it and watch it and my, my, my girlfriend at the time she was just like you're crazy like what are you doing I was like this is amazing do you not see what's yeah, happening no, it's, 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 it's a process and you seem like wow whatever that is is turning into a thumb exactly right? yeah, yeah, yeah. you want to clap? <laughs> Take two, take three. You say half frost, scene two, <laughs> take one. <laughs> take one. <laughs> All right. So, polyunity is a long story. So, when I was a medical student back in 2014, I just got really interested in 3D printing as a tool in medicine. Um, you know, it was like kind of the dawn of the age of mainstream 3D printing, and NASA was doing some 3D printing in space and stuff like that, and I'd be just a nerd. So, I, I, I just started thinking about Newfoundland and healthcare and some of the challenges that are. Uh, present here and a few of which are like you know remote locations challenging weather distributed population stuff like that so the thought in my head was if NASA can 3d print something in space I can 3d print something in Port of Basque or remote <laughs> Labrador right it's like the same thing yeah, 100%. so yeah the idea of teleporting metal, medical equipment uh, snuck into my brain and <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so like, like I said, um, the idea of teleporting medical equipment uh, just stuck in my head and uh, really, really, really ran with that for, for a few years in medical school. We started an initiative um, at the medical school called MunMed 3D and it was uh, basically just a place for medical students and healthcare professionals to come and play with 3D printing, think about what it could do. And uh, that grew into its own department at Memorial University and is still existing there today, but um, my co-founders and myself, that's uh, Dr. Michael Bartellis and Dr. Travis Pickett, uh, just wanted to enter the entrepreneurial sphere with it. So we uh, incorporated and, and, and got the ball rolling and here we are today, that's about three years after incorporation now. And uh, what we're doing is the, the, the vision is the same. Uh, our goal is to digitize hospital procurement. So um, it's an area that I feel has like significant value in the future, focusing on like on-site, on-demand printing of medical equipment. Uh, we achieve this by designing things that will come off of 3D printers functionally. Uh, we want to distribute 3D printers around various hospitals and regions and uh, we've developed a software suite and applications that allow people to just access the products that they want, drag it to a printer and it prints. So in theory that eliminates a ton of supply chain issues which we've seen over the last year. I mean you got the likes of the pandemic and the Panama Canal, both of which have resulted in goods and services being halted around the, the country and the world. Um, so it's kind of interesting if you could just make something in your own uh, facility or, or backyard, right? And, and it just sidesteps any complications you might have with uh, supply chain. I know a lot of like medical um, uh, you know, equipment used for uh, you know, actual surgeries, for example, or even training, right? They're really expensive. Mm -hmm. and 3D printing you know, these equipments, it's just really an expensive way to... And it's really good as well because you don't have to... Like you say, worry about the supply chain and stuff. Yeah. You can tell yeah. everyone just print their stuff. And the customization aspect of it is kind of cool too because like the traditional way of manufacturing things is you spend a lot of time and energy and resources in creating one thing, right? right. So you, you would tool a machine out for injection molding and you would only mass produce one thing. Uh, what we do, a little bit different, is we can customize and change every part of a product based on what the customer needs and we can do it in an hour, yeah. right? And then start making it immediately. So like uh, over on the shelf over there, I can, I can show you later, is um, these vial trays for Pfizer vaccines. And when they were rolling these out in the province, um, they didn't have a tray that would keep the vaccines upright and if they tilted sideways they were spoiled. Oh, yeah, yeah. So they had to be upright and they had to fit in different shapes and sizes of coolers so to keep them cold. Yeah. So we just got a single Pfizer vaccine and we use a, a technique called parametric generation. It's kind of like um, when you make a 
table on Excel or something. Yeah. <laughs> you just choose how many rows and columns, yeah. and uh, our, our software can automatically generate these sizes. So depending on the shape and size of the coolers, we they were just like, yeah, that won't fit. So we just scaled it down a bit and printed off X amount of those, right? So the first set of, uh, actually even the next set, like this most recent rollout has all gone out in, in trays that we printed here. So you've nice. made uh, storing vaccines much more efficient through 3D printing. Transporting them, yeah. 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 And also, like beyond that, there's also like custom scanning as well. You can do like, yeah. cust uh, you know, for example, customer specifically that, that has something that, that maybe, I don't know, deformed and it's, it's difficult for you to, I don't know if I'm explaining. No, no, you, you, you are. You're right on the, you're right on the nose. Like yeah. one of the things we do for the hospital as well is, is uh, help with some cancer care. So um, when you get radiation therapy to like a piece of your anatomy, let's say your nose and you have a little cancer on the inside, right. they focus a beam on your nose, but you need to have a protective coating over your nose to make yeah. sure that beam goes to where it's got to go. Mm -hmm. So we can get CT scans of people's like head or hands or whatever and we print the section of their body that they would need to make the protective coating off right. of it and we print that and give it to the technicians at the cancer clinic they make the piece that they need from that and then what that saves is like I'll give you an example is like there was a patient from like St. Anthony or something like that is like you know eight hour drive yeah. so that patient was gonna have to fly to St. John's get his face plastered and casted and then they would make the positive from that negative yeah. make the piece and it was like hours and hours and hours this guy would have had to fly back and forth for like you know three or four trips yeah. but we saved him all the travel because we just printed his face yeah right yeah. so it's like not only is it time consuming but it's also pretty scary for the patients to get oh, in the very uncomfortable method. very uncomfortable yeah so yeah little applications like that like custom stuff for hospitals and treatments and adaptive devices and custom grips for like occupational therapy is all stuff we're playing with but the idea of immortalizing um, like, like medical equipment that gets used every single day, that's, that's kind of the more interesting thing and the value for, for like hospitals and stuff. That's what yeah. we're, we're going for. Yeah. So uh, we know that during the pandemic, Polyunity had a big role in mass producing face shields. Mm -hmm. uh, would you say that kickstarted your partnership with Eastern Health? So interestingly enough, we were partnered with Eastern Health prior to that and we inked the deal like maybe a month before. So we, we kind of had this space already secured, but it was under the premise that we were making medical simulations. So we were doing like, like you know, some myringotomy, which is like ear surgeries, uh, rib cages for chest tube insertions. Like we had a whole suite of sims and we were going to manufacture them here and use them for training around the province, which is something we're still doing. But then once we got here, pandemic hit and uh, I don't know, I just, I, I kind of just reached out to Eastern Health and said, if there's a PPE shortage, we might be able to help. And uh, anyway, shields fell in our lap. And I mean, within the span of a week, we had designed a functional face shield. We got Health Canada approval. We partnered with a few other local uh, entities like Task Force NL, DF Burns. And uh, within the span of like two weeks then, we were making, you know, a hundred shields per day in-house here on our 3D printers. The following week, we were making 2,000 shields a day. On our wow. 3D printers, yeah. That's insane. That's a lot. Yeah, it's crazy. It was it was pretty cool, and it was like a lot of the ideas we had about mass manufacturing on 3D printers we never really did before. So the learning curve was extreme. Yeah. But once we figured it out, we were like, oh yeah, we're onto something here, yeah, right? It's yeah. a good start as well. I think from yeah. here you can really get into more complex. Uh, yeah. Things. Stuff, mm -hmm. yeah. This was complicated because not everything was 3D printed. Like right. just the headband portion was, but the the, the plastic wasn't, that yeah. wasn't 3D printed. But we had to figure out. Like I was at the engineering building every single day trying to figure out how to cut them appropriately and then mass produce those to match our production on the printers. Yeah. But long story short, like we just we just delivered our hundred thousandth shield to Eastern Health. No that's yeah. amazing. That's insane. Yeah, over the wow. course of a year. So you would probably say that. Um, the pandemic kind of did not hinder PolyUnity's business. No, no, it was the exact opposite. Like, and, and it's unfortunate that it took a pandemic to like prove the idea, <laughs> but it, like it certainly did in, in like a climate where, like I said, the, the supply chains were disrupted and everything was helter skelter and we had to rely on what we had in province to, to protect ourselves. Uh, having this as a resource just proved very useful. Yeah. yeah. It goes to show that starting in St. John's mm. was a pretty good move. Oh, it absolutely. shows that like 
there is potential in uh, entrepreneurial businesses here in the province. Not a potential. I think it's a breeding ground for innovation. And I, I say this all the time, is that when the environment is challenging, you come up with the most creative ideas, yeah. right? Yeah, that's definitely right? true. And, and here in particular, for healthcare delivery, we face the hardest, I think, situation in Canada in terms of resources and distribution and stuff like that. So... Yeah, I, I, I think some of the like local entrepreneurial pursuits and the the tech sector, like we have we have the likes of like SurgeCon, which is an emerge management software system, Breathe Suite, there's remote patient monitoring and like there's there's endless like things popping up and all of them are birthed out of a place that is just challenging to deliver care. And if we do it here, it's applicable everywhere else, right? So it's just a matter of disseminating that and getting the word out that we're, we're doing what we're doing. Yes, yeah, yeah. students don't really tend to know that there is potential in work over here in the province. Yeah. They just think yeah. that it's a small province yeah. and there's not yeah. much to go, but they'd yeah. be surprised. Especially again, like you mentioned, the medical field, because everything is, it's, it's very scarce. And I know, at least to my knowledge, like specialists here, that you, there's only a handful mm -hmm. and they're all spread across the province or they're all in St. John. So if, if anybody from way far away, you know, mm -hmm. they, they have to travel to St. John's. Absolutely. That's, that's yeah, it's challenging. It's hard yeah, yeah. and costs a lot of money. Definitely. Yeah. Um, so do you have any plans for expansion for PolyUnity or do you think that St. John's is where you'll be staying? Good question. Uh, no, so so like this is the beauty of, of the scaling of this idea is that in order to achieve what we want to do, which is true distributed manufacturing, instead of having a central factory that makes you know a million of something and then has to ship it all over the world, we put little micro manufacturing hubs all over the place that can make their own stuff as they need it. Right, that's the whole idea. So we've uh, we've actually just recently opened a second facility at the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ottawa. So where my two co-founders are doing the residency training, we have a facility just opened up there. We have an engineering work term student who's hired on working on site in the hospital and people are coming in every day bringing new ideas, new products and uh, our catalog of products is getting bigger and the use of the uh, the whole distributed manufacturing thing is, is working. So it's, yeah. That's amazing. Kind of, yeah. Yeah. Congrats on that. Thank the you. Thank you. And hopefully, and hopefully that's a, that's a Tinder box now, right? Like mm -hmm. once you get two sites in healthcare and you know, people start to use it and see that it has some kind of value to it, it tends to be a pretty exponential uptake after that. So yeah. we're, we're trying to learn lessons and do it in a small way right now. But I see a future in which like, this, this could be pretty potent in, in, and, and a common thing in most hospitals. Definitely. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah, so what would you say is next for PolyUnity? Is that something you can't really talk about? Oh, no, no, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> what next is... is There's a lot of potential for your... Oh, huge yeah. amounts, huge amounts. I think, like, at this point in time, it's a bit of a... You know, we're at a research and development phase, like... It's a pretty lofty idea and there's a lot of hurdles that we're still coming across every day in terms of product regulations, product use, use in hospital. Um, how do you market this? How do you sell it? How, like, like there, there, there's so many pieces of this puzzle and it completely disrupts the way that normal hospital procurement goes. So we're fully aware of the, of like, like the, the red tape and stuff like that. But I think what we're doing now is kind of just putting our nose down. The more products we make, the more we test it, the more people we get exposed to it, then that's the answer to, to, to how we get this disseminated more globally. But um, the short answer is just keep doing what we're doing and, and just hope we get more exposure over time and get more people using it. Then we get more feedback and we can do our job better. Yeah. I think as well there's, there's like a huge thing, like I mentioned before, for for uh, training equipment for like medical students, for example, because mm -hmm. you know you're obviously not going to tell them to, to practice on, on a patient immediately, right? <laughs> I'll tell you a funny story. <laughs> okay. Like, like the, uh, what you say, the the, the myringotomy. Uh, myringotomy. Right? Yeah, yeah, I know, yeah. I know that uh, you know. Uh, I saw it right there. It's really cool because yeah. uh, you can, I think, uh, put tubes and ears. Is what, yeah, is what you do. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. can you can use it to check, for example, uh, for eardrum. Ear, yeah, yeah. disease in your ear or eardrums yeah. and all that. So when I started medical school, the options were to learn how to suture. So like forget putting tubes and ears, that's a bit of an advanced procedure, but something as simple as suture. So it's like, like I said, the, the options are you sutured on a banana in a cafeteria or it was on a person. 
and a lot of procedures, again, given Newfoundland and Labrador is like, like population and amount of providers and training abilities and, and facilities is you kind of just go trial by fire and, and, yeah. and sometimes like, like you are your first time doing something is on a person. So we thought that was, you know, a little bit ridiculous when, when across the globe and specifically like, you know, bigger centers in like Toronto and stuff, they've got entire facilities dedicated to medical training. So we yeah. wanted to make task trainers that were cheap and you could make on site and we could use them across Newfoundland and Labrador. So like I said, like tracheotomy simulator, rib cage simulator, things like this. But again, that was a, another life ago and, and, yeah. and certainly a useful thing, but uh, like, like we've pivoted a little bit from, from our origins, but it allowed us to get really familiar with 3D printing and what it could do, right? Yeah. Yeah. But it's definitely moving forward because I was, I, was uh, you know, I was on Instagram and I was seeing because um, I'm interested in like medical stuff. Right? I used to want to be a doctor, but I'm like, okay, yeah. I like engineering as well, so yeah. I'm just going to focus on engineering. But uh, I, I I was seeing these, these this video of a doctor, I think, uh, simulating or teaching or showing people how, how stitches are done, and he's doing it with a silicone kind of yeah. thing. Yeah, so we pioneered that one. That, yeah. that's, like, that's like one of our first products ever. And we manufactured that out of MonMed 3D, and, and the entire med school used them. Surg surgical programs used them. ENT programs used them. Yeah, yeah. So we, 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 yeah, I yeah. was in ProtoMed. ProtoMed. Yeah, so really yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, it was a bit of a. It was like a little bit of a, a an aside of what we were doing, but that was more the engineering front of yeah. it versus medicine. Yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was, I was. It was really cool as well because I've never actually three D printed before that, but I've always been interested in yeah. three D modeling and stuff. Yeah, yeah. So I'll, I'll show you actually, but I kind of brought this. I, I was doing the first time I actually did a three D printing thing. You're just looking for a work term, aren't you? Yeah. This is. This is a. There was a. <laughs> You like it? It's like a face. I do. I do. Yeah. yeah it's it's like a, I believe it was a workshop or something from from the Commons yeah, yeah. University. It was like a, a VR based. Uh, so you were like drawing in yeah, VR. Yeah, drawing in VR. And, and this was, is what you made. Yeah, I made that. That was yeah. really cool. And um, I was like, oh, you know, I'm 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 definitely into 3D modeling. And I, I really enjoyed it. But it's cool when you when you just have an idea and you just yeah make 100%. it yeah yeah it's, it's I like, take it for granted right like it's like yeah. it's like I, I you think of something or or anybody and this is the magic of three D printing is like someone comes in the shop they're like I would really like to see this and the next day we're like here you go and they're like what you yeah <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah exactly yeah and it's really really cool I've seen three D printers in action I was very surprised the first time I saw them like I just could not stop staring and yeah. everybody was yeah. laughing they're yeah. like. What, what is so fascinating about it? And I said, how fast it actually like, gets the thing done, yeah. you know? Yeah. I mean, it's a process as well. Like, you have to mm -hmm. wait for it to dry and all that. You have to, yeah. you so, so these ones, you pop it off, ready to go. Really? Oh, yeah. Really? Oh, yeah. Kidding, oh, no. Right. So these ones are, like, pretty fast and, and good at what they do. Like, the first one I bought was, like, 300 bucks off of Amazon in, like, 2014. And the thing was the size of, you know, like, it was, like maybe half a foot by half a foot in size and an object as big as like my thumb would take 13 or 14 hours no, no, and no, I would no. literally sit there and just watch it and watch it and watch it and my, my, my girlfriend at the time she was just like you're crazy like what are you doing I was like this is amazing do you not see what's <laughs> yeah, happening no, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a process and you're seeing like wow whatever that is it's turning into a thumb exactly right? yeah, 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 yeah. No, that's really insane so it must be like so surreal to to start from something so small to having so many 3D printers around you that do work so much faster and so mm -hmm. much more efficiently, yeah. you know? Oh, hugely, hugely. Yeah, yeah. And, and the times are changing and this technology is just like, it's something like I've never seen like in the span of six years from going from what I had to what we're using right now. And even, even like the more industrial scale 3D printing, they're doing like metals and carbon fiber yeah. and, and all these different materials. Now the machines are expensive, but I, I foresee a future in like maybe five years where that's going to be just as accessible as this style of printing yeah. is, right? I even heard they're trying to 3D print food. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so they, they Meat. Like yeah. protein or something. And they just extrude it into yeah. like a steak pattern. Yeah, yeah. that's insane. Wow. Well, maybe that's the future, right? Oh, it is, <laughs> yeah, isn't it? Just buy a 3D printer, put it in your house, and whenever yeah. you feel like you want a steak, let's go. Yeah. yeah, circuitry is now a thing too. So yeah. like you can print circuits straight into plastic. So like, I mean, I mean, it's it's rudimentary and and, and simple in when you hear it that way, but like you could probably 3D print a cell phone in the future, right? Like like have all the materials raw and then just like pop out yeah no 100 like think about think about like paper printers like like even in my lifetime 
my dad worked for Xerox, so yeah, printers run, printers run yeah. the family, right? Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, just the next step. Yeah, exactly, yeah. but but it's it's natural, right? Like like he he had a Xerox paper printer and he brought it home because he worked for Xerox and like he had a computer screen which had a picture on it. He hit go and that thing came off a printer. I was like, this is mind boggling, right? Yeah, yeah, but it's yeah. the same thing. And now look at mm-hmm. paper printers; they're yeah. they're everywhere, yeah. right? Yeah. When yeah. I was younger, I, I think I, I would imagine that in the future there'd be technology where you'd be you'd print. But then it'd be like a video going. <laughs> I don't think we're Harry we're Potter, close. Harry Potter yeah, style. Yeah, 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 I don't think we're close to that. But three D printing is just—it's a whole other level of just yeah, and tangibility. It's ever growing. Like I don't see a point where three D printing is not going to be a very valuable asset in this mm-hmm. world. You know, mm-hmm. or not around. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So besides three D printing, you know, and what else do you do besides being here? Well, like I'm a I'm a practicing family doctor. Like I, I work out in Holyrood. Um, and this is, you know, I kind of do both in parallel. Um, but yeah, you know, I just trained family medicine uh, in, a, in a training program in the province and, and recently opened up a practice out in Holyrood area. So that's like a lot of my time as well. Uh, but then like hobby-wise, I'm, I'm an avid outdoorsman. Like, like we're in the best province in, or in the best place in the world for outdoors. So yeah, like the, the coast is really nice. coast extraordinary. So like any spare moment I get, I'm camping or climbing or hiking or doing stuff like that. Yeah. I'm actually curious about the family doctor thing because, mm-hmm. you know, just thinking about the fact that you're, you, you balance this you know, entrepreneurial thing, 3D printing and all that, with the family doctor thing, that must take a lot of your time. It's, it's time consuming, but like, the field that I'm being an entrepreneur in is directly relevant. So it's yeah, not like, yeah. not, they're not opposing forces yeah. to me. If anything, they, they run like in, in tandem. Um, yeah. and, and the better I learn the healthcare system that I work within, the better I can operate a business within it yeah, too, right? 100%. So yeah. it's not yeah. like you're like a doctor one day and then an F1 no. driver the next. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But no, that's, that's really cool. Cause just thinking about it, uh, being in this field, you know, with all the knowledge you have from school, from your experience, it really helps as well to, because mm-hmm. if say I, I were to try to, oh, I want to, I have the idea of printing medical stuff and I, I know nothing about yeah. uh, medical yeah. stuff, it makes it a lot more difficult. Yeah, Since yeah. you're a practicing doctor, you see the problems in the system firsthand and yeah. therefore you can easily think of It's an interesting mindset and, mm-hmm. and I think it, it was a blessing and a curse because when I when I started and was in hospitals and stuff, my, my brain would automatically just look around and be like, "That could be fixed. That could be better. <laughs> yeah, like, what's yeah, that, what's that all about? 100%. I could I could make that on a printer. What's this? Like like yeah. literally everything I looked at and <laughs> and my, my co-founders were very similar, Michael and Travis, and 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 the two of them were just endlessly just sifting through OR stuff and being like, "Yeah, we can make that." Uh, that could be better. Uh, yeah, let's try this out. So, you know, <laughs> you like, guys see it in the flesh. And you're like, yeah. oh no. Uh, yeah. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, right. More efficient, cheaper, faster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 100%. Absolutely. Have Absolutely. you ever used any of your own stuff in your like practice? Uh, no, like like stuff that we make here. Mm-hmm. We're, we're we're in a weird world where like using things on patients is a, a much higher level of regulation, right? Yeah. So, mm-hmm. so yeah. that, that would be materials that would be under pretty like significant scrutiny. You have to go through trials and stuff like that. So yeah. the things that we're starting with, like the low hanging fruit are things that wouldn't necessarily interact with patients, mm-hmm. but they're still regularly used objects in hospitals. It's pretty necessary, obviously, yeah. I say. Yeah. I, I'm also curious for like, for anyone who's interested maybe in, 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 in the field of medicine, because like I said, I used to want to be a doctor, but now I was like, oh, you know what, maybe I, I'm not ready for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> but, but any advice for like future students who, who do want to get into the medical field? Because, you know, after, after you know, being in university, I realized that you don't have to be a doctor to be involved or a nurse to be involved in the Not at all. <laughs> I like, like I'm going to say this, but it's it's you know it's an interesting thought. Is I'm the exact opposite. Is where I, I was interested in medicine, but I had a huge passion for engineering, but didn't go into engineering. Right. So I found a way to smash the two of them together. Anyway, mm-hmm. like I'm not an engineer by trade. I'm not a business person by trade. Right. right? Um, I am by trade a physician, mm-hmm. but I've made a world for myself within medicine that incorporates entrepreneurship and engineering like I, I am terrible at actually drafting something up in a CAD file <laughs> mode but if I look over someone's shoulder I go do that 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 and that'll come off a 3d printer perfect and they and it, it works absolutely so expect to do it all alone. no and, not everybody's good at everything no but. exactly and so, so that's the team that's like that's like when, when we, we built this thing 
with the help of engineering work term students, right? Like, like we kind of on purpose targeted them as useful individuals, and and some some of them were like, um, you know, a little bit mission critical in their programs and needed help. And we were mission critical because we were a startup and had nobody that could do what I needed. So it was just a match made in heaven. And uh, like over the last three or four years, I mean, we've we've employed like you know, fifteen plus probably engineering work term students, a lot of which we've retained or came back, you know, it's like it's excellent. And the diversity of stuff we do is like mechanical software, you know, yeah. process, there's all kinds of and material sciences. So like all of it is applicable. Medicine as well, like if you're interested in the field, you don't need to think to be locked into medical school. Like like you just hit the nail on the head is it's an extraordinarily diverse field and you have yeah. administrative side of things, you have biomedical design side of things, you have a biochemical side of things. Like there's so many avenues to just get involved with it yeah. in some capacity, right? What did you do for your bachelor's before going into med school? Good question. So yeah. I, I, I took a windy road into it. I was, uh, I did biology so like mm -hmm. applicable but yeah. I did like um, and then a bit of a psych spin so I did like my, my honors was actually in entomology which was in insect science right wow yeah. really yeah and my then my roommate actually did a course about that and she used to go around and her project was to collect around bugs 50 bugs yeah so that's, that's what I did yeah 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 collected bugs yeah yeah it was like Pokemon you had to go <laughs> yeah, like catch them all and you had to pin them and say yeah. what they were and stuff yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I did my honors degree in bugs. In bugs. Yeah, and then uh, after that, I applied to medical school. I didn't get in, um, so I moved to the UK and I did a master's in international public health at the University of York. Then I applied to medical school again. And I didn't get in, so then I became an ice maker and a bartender at the local curling club. So I made water colder for a year, and that was my whole job. Uh, and then I applied again, and imagine, after getting a master's and an undergrad, they didn't let me in, and I was like, I was a bartender for a year. They're like, we love it. No, no, just, no just kidding, I'm just kidding. There's more to it than, more, 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 more to it, more to it than that, but like, yeah, it was, it was just interesting. So it took me, yeah, it took me like three, three years, three tries to, yeah, to get in. It's a lesson to, yeah. to a lot of students to go to show that like, you don't have to get it from your first time. Yeah, and, uh, no, no, you just yeah. have to be persistent if it's really your passion. Yeah. Because I know as well that I think there's a there's this YouTuber that I follow. He uh, he did his bachelor's in engineering or something like that, and he ended up becoming a. Doctor. There were six engineers in my medical school class. Really? Yeah, trained and went back to medical school. Very I common. Business student who yeah. went to med school. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So. It, Music, music school, also a huge uh, intake for medical school. Really? Yeah, because they're, they're meticulous. They mm -hmm. memorize things like yeah. you wouldn't believe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're dexterous, you know, like yeah. a lot of, a lot steady of hands. steady hands yeah, and yeah, performance, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Like when you're doing something, they're just calm and cool. So like, always move forward. Yeah. yeah. Don't, yeah. There's just no think. such thing as too much learning. No, 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 I think a lot of people give up because because you know they get turned down by the fact that oh you know university is difficult or you know I'm I'm failing classes I'm a, I'm a failure in life mm -hmm. and all that. A lot of people let their age hinder them too. They're like oh I'm yeah. too old like what am I gonna do? Yeah. You're never too old. Like I, I or too young goes both ways, yeah, right? You're exactly. like I'm I'm too young to make a difference. Like no, you're not. If you had no. a good idea, you might peak early and then you know you just taper off as you go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hit your <laughs> hit your prime. Yeah. <laughs> your toast. Well, you might hit your prime when you're sixty five. Sixty five. You might become. That's, what I'm, that's what I'm banking on, man. Yeah. <laughs> the next uh, Iron Man, seventy years old. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> What would you like to tell to the students who are watching this? I think anything I would say would be around the theme of like, if you have an idea, explore it, right? Like it's like it, as, as out of the box as you may think it is, like refine it and it could work, right? It's like yeah. uh, the, Newfoundland and Labrador, like I said earlier on, is like it's a hotbed of innovation if you look around and think critically about what some of the problems are then then just just start moving and like from an entrepreneurial perspective no one's going to say okay out of the gate or that's a good idea out of the gate and and don't let that like discourage you yeah. and it's a slow and steady process and i find just the more you communicate your idea and snowball the snowball effect is real right like like you you say what you you think you want to do and then the right people will will come and snowball in around you and next thing you know you're you're sitting in 66 pippy place with a 
13 employees or whatever, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh, there must be like 60 or so in here now, yeah. And a bunch of curious students. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and the other thing too is in terms of like opportunity, don't be shy. Like, like if, you're, if you're wanting to get your foot in the door in particular industries, don't be shy. Newfoundland is like an extremely hospitable place and all it takes is an email or a phone call or a text or ask a question, go to a conference and like next thing you know, you're working there, right? Like it's, it's seriously open and every single one of the tech startup companies here now are looking for hungry, interested people, so. Networking here takes you a very long time. Yeah, day. yeah. And it's quick and easy because there's like 500,000 people here. A lot of people, a lot of students don't realize the value of networking, yeah. but you know, they know that networking Absolutely. Anyways, thank you so much for your time, Steven. No, thanks for coming.